great. Thank you. Okay. We, are, uh, we are at the World War II Roundtable in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Yep. And uh, you've been setting up various books, and we were just recently looking at a book, yeah. uh, Albert Speer, Inside the Third Reich. And uh, you started to allow us how um, we're talking about Fritsch. Yeah. Well, Hans Fritsch. My, my acquaintance with him, not a direct one, is that where we lived from 1949 till 1952, a place called Eichstätt, about 50 kilometers south of Nuremberg, that was the prison, the German prison in which Fritzscher was being kept. Mm -hmm. So it was about a block from where I lived. I always walked past the prison uh, on the way to school, and that's where I first, from my parents, heard about the Nuremberg trials. Uh, I also have Fritsch's book, which was published already back in the uh, late 40s, 1949 is the edition. It's called Es sprach Hans Fritsch, Hans Fritsch spoke. And it deals with, and it's, it's been some years since I've read it, but the specific thing is it deals with the last week and a half in Berlin, some of his last trips to the radio station to broadcast. I don't remember anymore how many details he knew, but he knew that Hitler had committed suicide. And the reason that the book sold so tremendously in the late 40s, and where my parents also said, you know, you should read it if you want to find out what was going on, is that it was the first inside look that was published in the German language about the Lubyanka prison in Moscow. And it's Fritzsche that was one of the ones that mentioned that the big difference between Lubyanka and any other prisons that he had seen, heard, and so forth about is, in that prison, they made you feel guilty. Mm. In most prisons, the prisoners sort of are rebellious because why am I in here? Fr Fritsche basically was <coughs> saying, you know, they made you feel guilty. They wore you down in that fashion. And that's why the book sold. Again, I can't give you everything. The one thing about Fritsche, just like, uh, what was it, uh, Schacht and Neurath, von Neurath were the ones that were also acquitted. They, of course, were immediately jailed by German authorities in the American zone of occupation and thrown in jail. And uh, Fritsche, in his book, and I just looked at it this morning, has the charges against him. He's basically being jailed for 10 years, and he's forbidden to work as a teacher, as a broadcaster, as a journalist, blah, 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 all these things. Uh, it's an interesting view. Now, why was Fritzsche in the main trial? And that is, uh, in some reading I've done, uh, most of the people that were in the first trial became prisoners of the Americans or the British, partly because they didn't want to be captured by the Russians. Uh, they got themselves out of the way. The only major prisoner that the Russians captured was Erich Rader, the, uh, the Grand Art Admiral, until 1943. And then they basically were looking for who else. Well, Fritzsche was sort of the highest ranking of the propaganda ministry that was around. They had him, and so they offered him up along with Rader as the two people that the Soviets were able to give to the trial. And of course, the Soviets were also very pissed at the end that Fitcher, among other things, <laughs> didn't get uh, condemned. But anyway, he was jailed. I don't remember exactly when he got out of jail. I wouldn't be surprised if you can find that on Google. Uh, but again, he was, he was my introduction. My, my par the stories I got from my parents about the Nuremberg trials is basically sort of uh, history as Ranka would put it. Just, you know, the facts of what happened. There was little editorializing except that, yeah, they all deserved it. Yeah. And the only other thing that I remember my parents commenting about is uh, they too, even though they, they were anti-Nazi, uh, they too said it was sort of cute that Goering was able to commit suicide, uh, you know, that, that he was able to play that last trick on the Americans. I mean, th there was a sort of a malicious joy that even they had, even though basically they said the, uh, the SOB deserved <laughs> a death sentence. There was nothing else to it. And- I'm curious, so, you know, you were born in Germany, mm -hmm. whereabouts? 
I was born in Schneidermüll, which was part of West Prussia. Well, actually, it was part of a weird little province called Grenzmark Posen Westpreußen. It was the western remnants of the uh, provinces of West Prussia and the province of Posen, Poznan, uh, that remained German after the First World War. The eastern part became part of East Prussia. Uh, matter of fact, our town, the, the town my father was born in and that I was born in, uh, should have gone to Poland in 1919, except they had a huge demonstration in the summer of 1919 saying, we're German and want to remain German, and somebody in Versailles sort of looked and said, well, holy cow, there's no Poles living in that town. Okay, okay, it's at the edge of Provence, Poznan, we'll let the Germans keep it. I mean, that's my theory. I have not been able to research that that's what really went on at Versailles. This is opinion. Um, the reason I was born in, well, my parents were actually living in Berlin already, but uh, in the, I was born December 1940, and in the fall of 1940, in reprisal for the Battle of Britain, the British were flying some very inefficient bombing attacks on Berlin, just random attacks. Mm -hmm. And you probably have heard about that, it's published in all the literature and all that stuff. So my parent, my mother, to give birth, went back to the town, Schneidemühl, where uh, her parents lived and my father's father, my father's mother was already dead. By the way, if you're looking for Schneidermühl on a map, look for Piwa, P-I-L-A, that's that L with a line, in Poland. That's where it is today. Uh, by the way, there, since we're talking about that, interesting statistic. Uh, my last visit in Schneidermühl as a little four, three and a half year old was summer of 44 and I have a few scattered memories that are my own. 2011, I finally was able to visit with uh, Germans <coughs> from the Ur Schneidemühl area in the, itself and befriended the two town historians. And I asked one of the town, one of the town historians mentioned, look, you know, I've read through the minutes of the new Polish city council that came in in February 1945 when the Poles took over in town. And I said, good. Then tell me, what was the population of Piwa, Schneidermühl, in the summer of 1945? And he says, a thousand. But I'm not sure that that included the Germans that were in the camps just outside of town to be selected who is going to be expelled right now, who is going to be kept for a few years, it was three years historically, to help with the rebuilding and who's not going to be allowed ever to go back to Germany because they have a skill that we want. And those people actually did not get the right to return until after Gomolka took over in the fall of 56. Um, I said, interesting. It was a German town of about 46,000. It is now, in 2011, a Polish town of 77,000. And mm. you're telling me in the summer it was 1,000. That was the statistic that I wanted about what the Germans call Flucht und Vertreibung, flight and expulsion. Mm -hmm. As I told you before, the 15 million Germans, of which many fled in time, uh, with almost nothing, uh, between a million and a half to two and a half million got killed, nobody knows the exact number. The rest were expelled afterwards. That's in the provinces of East Prussia, West Prussia, Pomerania, Silesia, as well as the Sudeten area. And it's the largest ethnic cleansing of the 20th century. The second largest at 11, 10 to 11 million, by the way, is 1947 when India and Pakistan split. Yeah. It's not the largest extermination. That's still the Holocaust. But then going back to what I mentioned to you before of the how I'm looking right now at the uh, Ukrainians that are fleeing into mm -hmm. Poland, Slovakia, and so on. It just, because I am from those areas, I've had relatives that had uh, you know, two hour in Well, my, okay, just take my grandparents. Uh, they were both well-to-do middle class, therefore somebody actually took the time on Friday, January 26, 1945, to wake them up and say, there's a train in town It'll leave in a couple hours. Get into it. Both of my grandfathers were over 60, so they weren't being pulled into the Volkssturm. And my maternal father, grandfather, 
the dictator without whom nothing worked in his business. He ran the railroad restaurant, a very successful uh, business. You know, was a quivering hulk sitting in the railroad carriage while his demure wife and her brother, it was sort of that triumvirate that ran the, the, the business, quietly picked up six little suitcases that they had pre-packed and brought them down to the railroad carriage. But they had two hours to get ready. And they knew already at that time they would probably never come back. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, the pre-packing, my father was through town from, the Easter, from what was left of the Eastern Front on the Vistula four days before the Russians came, which was the initial, was January 26, 45, and warned, the front has collapsed, get ready to flee. If it hadn't been that it was their son or son-in-law, they could have turned him in because that was defeatism, Wehrkraft Zersetzung, the destruction of the defensive force, as it was called in Nazi German. My grandmother and her brother listened and prepacked, like I said, six little suitcases so that two for each person, change of clothing, all the stocks and bonds that my grandfather was a millionaire, yeah. all the information on all the stocks and bonds and bank accounts and so on that he had, which finally got value again in 1950-51. So, oh yeah, so while they went from millionaire to penniless in the one hour, uh, and my grandfather died in 51, so he never got it back. He did continue to work in a railroad restaurant in West Germany afterwards. Uh, he worked till age 80 and then died. Uh, so she was prepared, but that was actually a treasonable activity to have prepared for fleeing. It's something that I think most people in this country, well, Anglo-American literature about World War II doesn't really deal m much with what went on in the Russo-German War, the Nazi-Soviet War, whichever way you want to call it. Uh, you know, most people don't even realize these things. But w as I see these people fleeing, uh, I've talked to, in this Schneidemühl group, this, what the Germans call the Heimatkreis, which were the uh, groups formed in the mid to late 50s of all the expellees who had survived in West Germany. Uh, each one of them had a story of how they got the news and oh my God, we made a rush for the train. Uh, our train got, ran into a Soviet tank column, 90% 80, 90 of the people disappeared. Uh, so I've heard too many of the stories of what went on with people fleeing. I have read too many of the stories of people fleeing uh, because I can speak, I'm bilingual, I still have German, and because that was my background, I have, I was asked my parents about it, I read about it. Now, as for myself, my aunt, my mother's half-sister, came to us in Berlin late in January. Her husband, who was a doctor who stayed in Schneidemühl, at the military hospital, and he was captured alive, and in some gunplay, the Russians shot him. Uh, he and another doctor put their wives onto troop, actually trains of wounded as auxiliary nurses two days before Schneidemühl, the Soviets got to Schneidemühl. And what my aunt told me is one of the aunts, one of my father's younger sisters actually came to the railroad station and spat at her feet and said, you coward. Says, all I had is my little day bag because I was going to visit you people in Berlin. So she came and the, the news somehow got out that most likely the Russians would take Berlin. And as my, my father was able to draft Dodge till the beginning of January, then he was called up and went to the front. Uh, but it, it had been like, you know, he had a driver because he, ha he had a job in the oil industry and he was entitled to a driver and he just t told him, Vincent, take care of my wife and son. So he said, fine, my parents in northern Bavaria, which ended up in the American zone of occupation, luck, uh, will take your uh, wife and son. And it was in mid-February that my mother, her sister, who was now already with us and 
Schneidemühl had fallen, been taken by the Soviets, uh, basically leisurely packed up a couple little suitcases. I was allowed to pack one of my school satchels, of course I was only four, four years and two months at the time, with what toys I wanted to take and then it turned out it was too heavy for me to carry. We went to the city railroad, the S-Bahn, took it and went to a town, Borgheide, just outside the southwest of Berlin, which was a traffic hub for the German Wehrmacht. And we were there for 10 days trying to find an empty truck going south because we were going to go south to Bavaria to them. Uh, but again, my, uh, as my mother said, as we left the house, I turned around one more time, looked at it and said, that's the last I will see of it. So in a way, uh, I fully understand how some of these people feel now in the Ukraine that, you know, they just left. Maybe their house is already destroyed. They took what they could carry. They may never be able to go back. It's all part of my past also. We met, uh, one more <coughs> interesting. Now, I remember part of the staying in this little Borkheide. Uh, I had some memories because in, 19, in February 91, just after the reunification of the two Germanys, I purposely went there. And yes, it, I identified, oh my God, that was where the railroad track crossed. That's right, it was oblique. This is the place. Now we stayed just beyond there and I drove on and I saw some people in front of a house and I just told them, I says, you know, I'm looking for my past. And I said, by the way, isn't, is that airfield still over there behind the trees? And the guy looked at me and says, how the hell do you know about that airfield? Yeah. It turned out it was a uh, emergency airport for the East German Air Force and the, all the locals were not allowed to talk about it. And I said, well, that's, I remember as a kid, that's where the fighter planes were. And I can remember the airplanes. And he goes, yep, sure enough, it was still there. So we were there 10 days, got on a truck, went south. It was a two day trip and we ended up in a place called Nyla in Upper Franconia, five kilometers inside the American zone. If you look for it on the map, look for Hof, H-O-F, and go just west 10 kilometers and you can't miss it. And we stayed with these people that were the parents of the driver of my father. Well I mean, talk about, there was no connection there except that uh, the, the, the old Mr. Lung was actually the former social democratic mayor of town. My father's driver had been a social, young social democrat who had been re-educated at Dachau for one year. I went back in 70 to interview him and three of his brothers, two of them had been young communists. He and another one had been young socialists, the young communists, two days, two years in Dachau, the young socialist one year in Dachau. But that's a totally different story. But, uh, you know, getting there. But the one anecdote I do want to tell. Okay, so we were in a truck and my mother and her sister were in the back of the truck. It, it, it had a cover over it. It was one of these covered trucks, but with, uh, uh, it was uh, canvas covered. It was basically an open truck with canvas. I was allowed to sit up front with the driver and evidently I was proud as hell, four, and a, four year old. I personally don't remember this. And there were two drivers always. The other driver was sitting on the front fender to look for fighter bombers. So at one point, my mother and her sister looking out the back saw several Mercedes limousines pulling up, gasoline powered without the wood powered, wood generator that was used. And as, and they, as they were about to pass, they realized why that guy was sitting on the fender up front. So they fall, fell in behind the truck. And it turned out it was a delegation from the Japanese embassy. Okay. Sure enough, there were some fighter bombers in the vicinity. Truck, the guy signaled, truck stopped. The driver grabbed me. My mother and her sister knew into the ditch immediately, you know, get a little bit away from the truck and just get under cover. It turned out for the Japanese, that wasn't enough. It was an open field and about, she says, about 50 meters across the field were some hedges and trees and scrubs and so forth. And here were all these Japanese 
She didn't ever tell me how many. She said, you know, there was a group, either in their dress uniform or in a diplomatic so dress. who had been in the German embassy. Oh, yeah. Okay. But I mean, in their dress uniforms, running across this field, and there had been some snow, so this was slippery, falling flat in the <laughs> mud, getting up and keeping running till they got to the, where, where there was some trees and so on to cover them. As it is, the fighter bombers never came over that part of the Autobahn. They never hit us. Everybody gets back in the truck. And my mother said, eventually the Japanese got back in their cars. We didn't see them again. Yeah, but she wow. says, it was a beautiful thing to watch. All these high gentlemen, as she said, diese großen hohen Herren, in their dress uniforms or in their uh, tuxedos, falling flat on their faces in the mud as they were escaping. Kind of a Keystone so, Cops moment. Exactly. Oh my gosh. So, now ultimately you did get into the American zone? We ended up in the American zone, five kilometers, yeah. and there was something that was called Ivan Schreck, the fear of Ivan at the time. I remember the word myself. In 1919, the border, the new Polish-German border came to five kilometers outside of Schneidemühl, where my father lived, when he was 10 years old. In 1945, we were five kilometers inside the American zone with the Soviets on the other side. So my father was looking for ways, how can we get out of Germany? And again, growing up in the late 40s, the Third World War was going to start any time. I mean, that, you know, I have some memories of Berlin and the air raids and so forth, but my real memories are the fear of the Third World War and the Russians are going to come right. and blah, blah, blah. He had some business contacts in Switzerland. So beginning in 49, he applied for a visa for us to get there. And then in September 51, some Baltic German friends we had said, you know, have you ever heard of the American Displaced Person Program? Mm. It turned out the original Displaced Person Program, 1948, was for the Jews that had survived in camps in the Western Three Zones. In 1950, and I think it was an executive Truman order. This, the first DP program was actually a law passed by Congress. It was extended to all other East European nationalities who had refugees living in the uh, Western three zones of occupation, including 54,000 Ger Germans born outside of the borders of 45. And we all were. We're from east of the oder Neisse line. So, you know, why don't you apply? Okay, we applied. And lo and behold, in March of 52, our American visa came through. Six months when if we had gone on the regular uh, visa program, the German quota would have been four year wait. Wow. At the same time, in March of 40, 52, also our permission to move to Switzerland came through. And then my father said, let's get the hell out of Europe and start anew. And the reason we ended up in, Mich in Minnesota is these two Baltic women, Baltic Germans who also were refugees, they came a little later, uh, they already had uh, relatives that were working at a, something called the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Oh, yeah. Huh? Rochester? Yeah, it's in a state called Minnesota. We had to buy a book and figure out what Minnesota was. And they advertised in one of the local papers here, and we had three offers for sponsors. Two were farms, and since our family has been city folk for several generations, we became housekeepers at a rich house hold out in Wayzata on Lake Minnetonka. Yeah. So that was my first view of the United States after coming here. We, we still took the boat to New York and then the train to Minneapolis. So that's how I got in. Oh, supposedly, we got the last three visas in, that dis in the German quota. This was 54,000 and a few hundred more wow. because there were publicity photos taken. And sure enough, when we got here, it's in the June 16th issue of the Minneapolis Morning Tribune. There's a smiling picture of the parents and their little 11-year-old boy holding their papers. Now, what you don't see is that the little boy has just said, Dad, the papers are upside down. Halt die Schnauze! Shut up! And Fati, Fati, th those are not our papers. Ich sag dir, halt die Schnauze! I said to you, keep, shut up! And that's when this little 11 year old boy learned that the pictures you see in a newspaper usually are posed. <laughs> anyway, let's end there. I, it's 5.30, I better go back to my job. Thank you so much, this is wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>